a lot of times when people think about black inner city culture, you know, a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, we shouldn't care because the people there put themselves there, you know what I'm saying? Or we shouldn't care because there's other problems in the world. Why should we care about the black people who are living in the inner cities and what they go through and their problems? But, you know, my answer to that was this show saying, if you don't care, wait, just hear me out. I'm going to tell you why you should care, you know what I'm saying? My name is Emmanuel Massillon. I'm a conceptual artist from Washington, D.C. I grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, around early 2000s, late 90s, uh, which D.C. is a really unique place in the sense we have a very uh, unique culture in the sense of music, food, um, dialect. Uh, particularly in my work, I talk about a lot of the inner city culture in D.C. Uh, because I grew up in it. Um, I think they call it like a first-hand account. So a lot of the work I talk about in the exhibition here in Paris, uh, Wait, Just Hear Me Out, is a lot of the stuff I experienced personally. My experience going to school in elementary, in elementary school, uh, going to school in a food desert, you know what I'm saying? I make the uh, sunflower seed paintings, talking about my, my experience and talking about like, you know, the African, the uh, inner city African-American diet. Food desert is a place where uh, there isn't like fresh food or grocery store in range of miles. So like in a lot of major cities, a lot of grocery store chains wouldn't put their grocery stores in African-American communities um, due to a plethora of reasons. They think maybe people are going to steal from the store or, um, or they just think the grocery store won't do well just because of the, the, uh, the income of the people in the area. So sometimes in spots of DC, there wouldn't be a grocery store for like, you know, miles or it might take two or three buses or a very long car ride. In more affluent parts of the city, there's grocery stores everywhere and access to fresh food. So when there's no access to fresh food, people turn to you know, the corner stores or you know, the quick snacks that are there uh, to get food. And you know, the food is like very high in sodium, high in cholesterol. And then a lot of, those, um, a lot of people eat those foods and develop a lot of health problems with like, you know, chronic uh, health problems that are, you know, popular in American black culture, you know what I'm saying, like hypertension, um, heart problems, uh, etc. So uh, just being in that, just me coming from that kind of inner city culture of DC, I just wanted to talk about it. You know, a lot of times when people think about black inner city culture, you know, a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, we shouldn't care because the people there put themselves there, you know what I'm saying? or we shouldn't care because there's other problems in the world. Why should we care about the black people who are living in the inner cities and what they go through and their problems? But you know, my answer to that was this show saying, if you don't care, wait, just hear me out. I'm gonna tell you why you should care, you know what I'm saying? We've been systematically disenfranchised through a number of different things. We're in food deserts, you know what I'm saying? Our only way out is sometimes sports, you know what I'm saying? And then I also like to combine a lot of these inner city themes with like traditional African history. So I do carve and use, I carve, hand carve and use a plethora of different found masks, you know what I'm saying? And combine them with kind of like these urban hip hop themes to kind of talk about, you know, kind of, kind of connect the past, the present and kind of talk about the future or the possibilities for the future, you know what I'm saying? But I did kind of want to start, like I said, just saying, wait, just hear me out. This is why you should care about inner city culture. This is why you should care about African-American history. And this is why you should listen. Being a conceptual artist gave me a different type of freedom because it wasn't just like, oh, I'm just a painter or I'm just a sculptor, you know what I'm saying? Or I just do installation. It's like, I could do multiple different mediums and put them all in a show and, you know, kind of tell my own story. Like, I kind of see myself almost as a way, uh, as like a musician. Uh, so depending on the subject matter I want to talk about, I might, you know, do a different medium. You know, for instance, I, when I talk about really rough subjects, I do like a wood sculpture like this, where it's very rough, and you know, you could feel a different kind of emotion. Or when I talk about, you know, the food deserts, I put the actual sunflower seeds. Where a lot of kids, when I was growing up in uh, elementary school, they ate a lot of those sunflower seeds. You know what I'm saying? Every single morning, 
actually it was so bad in my uh, elementary school that people were going to the corner store um, eating the sunflower seeds. And when you eat the sunflower seeds, you spit the seed on the, um, the shells out after you eat it. And it was so bad that the whole school floor was a school full of sunflower seeds. And they actually banned sunflower seeds from my school. And even when the school did offer breakfast for the kids or us, everybody was so addicted to the sodium from the corner store, they didn't want to eat fresh food anymore. So that's another part I wanted to talk about in my work too, you know. My practice is really based like off music because I'm very much inspired by like rap music. I do talk a lot about, um, I do believe like African-American music in particular um, is one of the greatest cultural preservers of like African-American culture. Because of any point of uh, uh, African-American history, if you wanted to know what was going on in the culture at the time, you could just listen to the music. A lot of people don't take hip hop music seriously just due to the beat. The beat is so hard. A lot of people would say, oh, that's party music. But if you take the beat away and really listen to the lyrics, a lot of these rappers in the inner city or mainstream rappers are talking about their addiction to drugs, sexual addiction, people dying in their neighborhoods, uh, mass incarceration, um, run-ins with the police. We're all problems in African-American culture, but a lot of people are putting it into the music, but people aren't really comprehending because they're you know, listening to dish the beat. And even people who are from where I'm from and live in the culture, they're just so fascinated with the beat, they don't really listen to the poetry of the music. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even if you divide a lot of these rappers, it's, you know, they rap into stanzas, so it's almost like poetry. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I just think, once again, like I'm very much inspired by that because I think about the music as being a preserver of history and culture. If you listen to a lot of these rappers, they're preserving their history and culture. If you look at one of my works, uh, like this one, for instance, um, it's called Spam to Lamb. And Spam to Lamb is a song by a rapper, uh, his name is G, American rapper named G Herbo. And the term Spam to Lamb talks about coming, kind of the ideology of coming nothing to something. Because Spam in the inner city is kind of seen as like this low quality canned meat, right? And lamb kind of being like this high-end meat. So kind of talking about when, before he became famous, he was eating like Spam, but now he has money, he's eating lamb. But lamb is also a double entendre to like a Lamborghini truck. So kind of, kind of talking about this ideology of coming from nothing to something, which I'm very much inspired by Dr. Claude Anderson, where he talk, uh, in a lot of his books he talks about black economics, you know what I'm saying? And people might kind con of call me crazy because I'm talking about G Herbo and Dr. Claude Anderson in the same sentence, but they talk about the same exact thing, but just in a different way. My background is a uh, Haitian, so I grew up on my mother's side, I grew up uh, traditionally Haitian. I think the biggest part of being Haitian that influenced my artwork was actual, the actual language of Haitian Creole. Because a lot of my work, like the titles, like this piece called Spam and Lamb, there's like very unique titles and you know, that's a, that's a slang term, you know what I'm saying? But even Haitian Creole, the way it was created was, uh, which is ironic that I'm here in Paris, France. But Par France uh, colonized Haiti and they were speaking French in the colony. So the, the, the Haitian slaves created the Haitian Creole kind of as a way <coughs> to um, disguise themselves and talk under the, you know, the disguise of, you know, kind of a language that was similar, but they created their own language and kind of like an act of rebellion. Like they were put in this, they were put in a situation where they had like maximum pressure applied to them and they created a whole new language out of their oppression. But I kind of see like inner city slang as a creation of a language through oppression, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I put a lot of slang or these kind of like slang terms in my titles because I was really much inspired by the Haitian Creole, the language that I do speak. That kind of Haitian culture and just the way we all connect through the diaspora because even if you look at Haitian sculpture and black Southern culture, is it, similar, you know, kind of like the foods, the flavor, but even the art is similar too, like the use of wood and the way different people use it from all over the world. You know, I kind of wanted to be in that kind of conversation. I think it's something in our spirit that we're all just connected, you know, kind of like this material of wood, found objects, of putting our life experiences into art and objects, you know what I'm saying? Um, and even like I was saying, like, to talk about 
I know I keep talking about music, but it is very much a big influence on me because I, I really love rap music. But even the sense of, like, I was talking about the drum pad, you know what I'm saying? Uh, like, even if you look at this show, you might see a little bit of another artist. You might see a little bit of Thornton Dio in the sculptures. I have the, uh, the piece called Caged, very much inspired by Betty Saar, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm kind of like a producer, just hitting the pad, hitting the pad. You might hear a sample from somebody else. You might hear my sample from my own life. You might hear a sample from somebody else, another person. You might hear a sample from a book I read. You might hear a sample from a sports reference, you know, a reference about fishing on the west coast of Africa. Um, you might see, you know, my dog food paintings, which talks about the civil rights movement, uh, where I actually put dog food on the actual paintings, you know what I'm saying? Uh, talking about, you know, black people being fed to dogs, and we actually were dog food, you know what I'm saying? But it's also crazy, too, because dog food is a slang term for heroin. You know, so because heroin in its raw state resembles dog food. And when, you know, like the, uh, I would like to say, uh, the drug addicts, they come ask for heroin, they're like fiending like a dog. So even that ideology of like the language, like kind of a rapper, like double entendre, dog food meaning two things, you know what I'm saying? And then actually putting dog food on the canvas for the texture uh, opens the conversation of like, you know, how digestible like black Americans have been to the system, you know what I'm saying? Um, so there's different ways you could think about it. Where I'm from in DC, um, it's very big on sports. I mean, I don't really know the statistics, but uh, I mean, I heard one time somebody said that, you know, being from the DC metropolitan area, which is like DC, Maryland, and Virginia, you have a highly uh, higher chance of like going to play like in the NFL or the NBA. You know what I'm saying? Just because of all the good schools there. So sports is really big on, in, in the culture in DC, you know what I'm saying? So I think even for a young African-American male such as myself, which like you look at the NBA, the NFL, it's predominantly dominated by African-American males. There's a lot of pressure coming from this area to go into that pipeline from like school, uh, school sports, you know, AAU, Pop Warner, then you go to like school, high school, to college and the NFL to really push you towards those sports because they have direct infrastructure. I think a lot of times too, a lot of people, they just see the sports players on TV, they're playing, but you don't know all the countless hours they had to go to the gym, you know? I knew people who didn't even go to class because we, um, the term, and this is talking about the language, we call it hoop dreams. So you have the hoop dreams of dreaming like being in a hoop, you know, and even in this show, uh, the show I'm doing here at uh, Julian Kaida Gallery, I, you know, I have the work Inner City Angel, and that work talks about, you know, how the basketball, basketball, and you know, the culture of the inner city all over is kind of like a, a guardian angel, savior angel coming down from heaven to save you from hardship, economical hardship, and takes you out of your, uh, you know, your kind of um, place in the inner city and takes you up to a higher level of like social status. Kind of like how a, an angel will come down from heaven and take you up to heaven, you know what I'm saying? I, I think that, that, you know, every time we try to elevate in this kind of American culture, like black Americans, there's always some like power structure to put us back down, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we try to do good, you know what I'm saying? You put us back down. So it, it's a lot of different things that happen, and I do touch on a lot of it in my work. Like even like uh, the works behind me, where I talk about mass incarceration, which a lot of people became mass incarcerated through drugs that were put in our community. But also too, we didn't have kind of like the access to education, or 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 or, or kind of like influence to do you know kind of be a doctor or a lawyer, get into the arts or kind of find a way to get money because nobody kind of would hire us, you know what I'm saying? Um, so the easy way to get money was drugs, you know what I'm saying? And so a lot of people, a lot of the American, uh, like the American government kind of, I, I, I believe they kind of knew this, and they said, well, you guys can't get jobs anywhere else, so we're gonna put these drugs in your community, get people very addicted to them, where they'll pay, sell their car, do anything to get these drugs, and then when we catch you with the drugs, we're gonna give you a whole, a, a whole bunch of synthesis, like life synthesis or elongated synthesis, where we're gonna build a whole prison industrial complex where we're gonna you know, place you and store you in. So that's why I have you know, a couple works in the show. I have the word caged, where I have an African mask hanging from a cage. 
and it's kind of broken because it's talking about like how this, uh, the system of like American mass incarceration kind of breaks your spirit and you're kind of like in this cage. Uh, then I have the work behind me, uh, the, the two phones, talking about uh, the cost of communication. We talks about that when you're actually incarcerated, the cost of communicating with a loved one outside of, um, outside of uh, prison. Uh, and then the, the cool thing about this work, if you actually look at the, um, the text, like the plate, it tells you the actual cost to communicate with a loved one. So if you're in America and you want to make a long distance, let's say, let's say I'm locked up in California, for instance, just to pick up the phone and call a loved one, it starts at four dollars. Then every every minute is eighty nine cents. Imagine every time you make a phone call to a loved one, it costs a lot of money. But let's say you're locked up, you was already in there. You know what I'm saying? Because you didn't have enough money and you were selling drugs and you're locked up, the people you know back home in your community with Canada might not have enough money to put money on your books, your commissary, or etc. So you can talk. So now you're just in jail and not be able to communicate with anybody. And if you know anything about basic human interaction, we as humans need to communicate with other humans. So now you're just locked up in a facility. And, you know, even when you're locked up, you kind of develop this animalistic nature kind of in prison. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I think that work is a very a much important work in the exhibition because it actually talks about the cost of communication. Not even the, the monetary like money, but the cost psychologically. Because even in prison politics, it, the phone is really big because it's your, your key to the outside world because you're in jail. So even using the phone, being on the phone too long, or your status in the prison industrial complex, I mean, you know, in the prison, determines how long you could be on the phone. You know what I'm saying? So it, that's why I think it's a very critical work. And even the work behind me, uh, which is a very personal work to me too, which is called uh, Easy Transition, which talks about the, uh, I don't think that's a conspiracy, but people call it a conspiracy, the conspiracy of the uh, school to prison pipeline, where you know they talk about the American school system and how school uniforms are used to subconsciously train you to become a prisoner, you know what I'm saying? Because uh, even in school, like um, one of my uh, family members was uh, recently locked up, and I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, well, well how was it in jail? Because I, I, I never really been, I never locked, been locked up, but he, something struck me in my, in my head when he said this to me. And he said, oh, it's, you know, it's okay. It's just, it's just like school. And you hear about the school to prison pipeline, but me hearing it from his voice made me go researching even more. And when I did my own research, it was one thing hearing it, but you know, you have the term seeing is believing. So when I saw the information on the internet and reading in different books, I was like, yo, you know, when I was in school, I remember if you didn't have the right uniform on, or you had the wrong color shoes, you wouldn't be able to go to class. You have to go to the principal's office or go to detention. You know what I'm saying? Or a, a lot of uh, women, uh, uh, people who identify as women, they would come to school and they would have short skirts on or maybe have like some of their uh, body parts showing. They would send them away because they didn't meet the strict requirements. You know what I'm saying? Um, or even like in, in prison, like a lot of the, the PA system tells you what to do or it dismisses you and tells you to move from section of the school to school, same thing in prison, you know what I'm saying? When that bell rings, the door opens, you gotta leave. You gotta do what the, the uh, uh, correctional officers tell you to do, you know what I'm saying? Or you get punished. So the same thing that happens in school. So I thought the school uniform was, um, was very important. Just talk about fashion, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, fashion uh, and, and kind of like how this uh, uniform is here to take away our individuality. To, you know, to, to kind of take us into like a number, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I just wanted to show people like, hey, this is why you should care about inner city black culture. This is why it's important. And this is why you should listen to what I have to say. Yeah. Please tell me that I can't, that I won't, that I fail, that I'll never make it out, yeah. Please tell me all the bad, never good, fill my head full of every single doubt, yeah. Please say any negative thoughts, I pop off when I hear people say I cannot. I get off to the thought of proving everyone wrong, I won't stop to the top, so you better back off and get lost.